Thank you, Monica. Good morning, and thank you for having me here. I just want to confirm. So I can use these to advance the slides? Okay, I'm gonna ignore you, and then when I look, okay. <laughs> I'm not going like this. <laughs> okay, so thank you again for having me here, and uh, what I'm gonna, kind of the focus of what I'm gonna be presenting here is a series of cases uh, that will be common conditions that are seen by pediatricians, then turn to be a very uncommon condition for our uh, ophthalmology practice. So I really don't have any disclosures or financial interests, but I have done some research. None of the material I'm gonna present is related to this. So the first case I'm gonna present is a patient that, uh, this is a video, so let's see if we can run the video. So if we click, okay, great. So this is a kid that has a nasal lacrimal duct obstruction. You can see he has some discharge over there, but the real reason he was referred to us is because his left eye is not moving really well. So this kid has early onset strabismus, and he has a condition that we known as Duane syndrome, but this is what is really interesting and unusual. He has an exotropia. And what you're gonna be seeing here is the lateral rectus muscle, and that is actually the surgical procedure and the findings that we saw in this very unusual case. So we are isolating the lateral rectus muscle to be weakened to correct the exotropia. And um, uh, as we disinsert the lateral rectus muscle to weaken the muscle, and we start moving the eye back and forth, we found that the, most, the eye was still very tight and it was not rotating really well. So then we looked more in detail and we found that actually there was a second belly of the same muscle inserted more posteriorly. As you can see here, we're cleaning a little bit of what we call tenons and then you're gonna see the lateral rectus muscle uh, second belly in a little bit more in detail, a little bit more posterior. As a matter of fact, I wanna um, say that this surgery is right now being done at one of our county hospitals here in Los Angeles with a second year resident. And the surgeon is the resident, I'm just the person who I'm um, assisting the resident. Anyway, so that's the second belly of the lateral rectus muscle, which actually we cut it, and you're gonna see in a little bit um, that after this cut, um, we're gonna be playing with two muscles moving back and forth. You can see we're kind of dancing with two lateral rectus muscles there, but the force duction test is uh, still positive. And then, this is very strange. So what we did is we looked for a little bit and wonderful surprise. There was a third lateral rectus muscle. So this patient actually, instead of having one, had three lateral rectus muscles that were actually causing a common problem that is called exotropia and Duane syndrome. And Duane syndrome is actually a very common condition that we see as pediatric ophthalmologists, but it's not common to see a patient with three lateral rectus muscles. Can we go to the next one? Okay. Just be aware, especially if the force reduction test is positive after you desinsert muscles, look for something else that may be there. Let's go to the next case. So this is actually an, uh, a patient, let's go to the slide. Um, this is a kid that is actually referred for a condition called ocular allergy. So this kid is having red eyes, not really itchy, but red eyes for several years. And this is the way I see the kid in my practice the first day I saw him, I say, well, the eyes are red, yeah, they look really red, Mostly in the interpalpebral area, um, he doesn't really have other findings for ocular allergies. But this kid is actually developing other conditions. So let's go to the next slide. So if you look in detail, just eye. put attention to the video look a little bit. His ocular movements yeah. are really not as smooth. Yeah, they're very saccadic. And um, if you actually look at those blood vessels, those are really not conjunctival yeah. infections. This kid has what we call telangiectasias. Let's go to the next slide. So this kid actually got the MRI the next day after this visit, and this showed that he has some cerebellar abnormalities. Let's go to the next slide, and this kid actually did not have ocular allergies. This kid actually has a condition called ataxia telangiectasia. It's an autosomal recessive condition, progressive cerebellar ataxia, associated with immunodeficiency, and even worse with malignancies. So this actually was a case of ocular allergies. Let's go to the next one, please. This is also another kid that come, let's go to the next, please. So uh, it's a video, it should be running, let's see if it goes. Can we click on the video? Perfect, thank you. So this kid is come because the mother is concerned my kid is not seeing really well, 
The eye contact right here. she used to have a great eye contact, it's about a right three-year-old kid. Now she seems to be just wandering around and playing a lot with her hands. Actually the diagnosis they, they the patient came with the diagnosis. I didn't make the diagnosis, but the mom told me this is typical of this kid. So I just want to make aware that a lot of kids that can have like something that the visual acuity is not normal, it's not typical. This is only the Let's only see time I've it. seen this condition, but look at the that. next slide. This kid actually had a condition called red syndrome. So matter of fact, this is the first time this um, this mother created this as uh, well, this kind of group of people here in the United States to make them aware of this condition. Anyway, this kid was completely normal up to the age of, I believe, two years, and then basically became like a kid that was regressing, going back, 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 and all she did was playing with her hands. Let's go to the next slide, please. So, one more. So this is also a video. Um, thank you. Here. So this kid actually also was seen at one of the county hospitals. And what he did was, he had this kind of a- Hey, you make up here. Eye movement. The mom the, the funny eye contact was not my diagnosis was the mom. Make, my, I'm here. here because my kid has a funny eye contact. And it was really go. like one eye would have this very small kind of nice stagnus. But what called my attention is that it was only on one eye. So I, whenever I see a patient with nice stagnus in one eye, I'm very concerned because that's not really normal. And yeah, there is a condition called um, spasmodic Newtons that can give you something like this. But if a mom told you, my kid seems to have a funny eye contact, that's abnormal. I believe on parents, okay? So let's get an MRI scan. Let's go to the next slide. And this kid had a huge cleft. It's called exencephaly. Let's go to the next one. And this is a really rare condition. And it's, uh, there's some association with mutation, as you can see on this slide. And if you... We're not gonna go back because going back and forth sometimes kind of make the computer not work, but this kid really had a small head. And so that's probably associated with, he had a small head, he has big, this big cleft that was like a hydrocephalus. He has, and they have typically nice stagnus, just like this kid had. So if you ever had that complaint of my kid has a funny eye looking or something like that, there's maybe something wrong going on. Okay, let's go to the next slide, please. Um, I want to just uh, mention like, Jonathan is here uh, from Children's Hospital because this case is a case that was actually shared with uh, the, his group at Children's Hospital, so I want to appreciate some of the pictures actually came from, from there. This is actually a patient that I also saw at one of the county hospitals here. Let's go to the next slide. So this patient is actually already being seen by genetics, and the only reason he was referred to our pediatric ophthalmology clinic is for a common condition the color of the eyes is very different. And as you can see, one eye looks like it's bluish uh, with these kind of uh, little dots in 360 degree. The other eye half is brown and the upper part is a little bit bluish like the other eye. What this kid have, no one really knows, but you can see a little bit of the history of this kid, developmental delay, um, hypotonia, eczema. And he has an ankle, so we start looking at it. Maybe this is family history, heterochromia, maybe ear problem, hearing problems, uh, maybe there's something else. Yeah, one uncle has high risk heterochromia, but we don't really know much because the father, and this uncle, excuse me, lives somewhere else. Let's go to the next slide. So these are some pictures that actually we took. Let's go to the next slide. This is actually coming from Children's Hospital in Los Angeles, and let's go to the next slide, and the next slide. So this kid actually turned to have bilateral retinoblastomas, and I know that, uh, you have published this paper. Let's go to the next slide. And this was published last year by the group, again, by the Children's Hospital. But this is actually a relative late sign of tumor invasion, neovascularization, and it's actually sectoral iris heterochromia is being described in patients with chromosome Q deletion, basically, in patients with retinoblastoma. Okay, so let's go to the next one. This is actually a very common problem, the opposite of the previous lecture. Let's go to the next slide. These are two kids. Sibling A is a girl, two years old. Sibling B is a five-year-old brother, and they're both very farsighted. And the reason they were referred to my practice is because they were very farsighted. The parents wanted to be sure, is this really that high? And it was really high. This kid actually now were like plus 16. The most interesting, I'm gonna go to the end, the visual acuity on the sibling B is like a 2030. It's extremely good. The girl has a little bit of isotropia and the visual acuity is more like a 2060, 2070, I believe. Anyway, the most interesting is something that we normally don't do. We don't really get imaging of the retina in kids that have 
hyperopia. It's not typical. Okay, let's go to the next slide. And so this is actually very interesting. When I saw the patient the first time, I said, maybe this is nanophthalmos, an eye that is kind of a small, it looks normal. I refer him to uh, genetics. Genetics said, well, it doesn't look like nanophthalmos, but let's run some genetic testing. Everything came negative. The mother, this is the most interesting, the mother called and said, I know what my kid has because I found the diagnosis in Facebook. I said, well, this is interesting. Facebook, and what does your kid has? And she said, my kid has this condition. We have already obtained the OCT, which she actually knew the result. And the OCT shows retinal falls, hypoplastic, which is very atypical. We don't really find this typical in patients with hyperopia. Next slide, but this patient has a condition called posterior microphthalmos. And this patient has retinoschisis, a macular hole, seropapilledema, and it's not really an anophthalmic eye, and it's not a microphthalmic eye. These patients are actually have very short axial length, and they have these abnormal retinal findings. Next slide. This is um, the last case I'm going to present. Okay, so this is a patient that I entitled recurrent cataract. Let's go to the next, please. So this is a kid that was referred to UCLA with a diagnosis of congenital glaucoma. He also had a subluxated lens and it's unilateral. So the first concern was, this is maybe traumatic. You know, you have a glaucoma in one eye, the lens is subluxated, there's something really wrong going there. But anyway, the patient had very high pressure, didn't respond to medication, he underwent a glaucoma valve chunt, uh, vitrectomy, lensectomy, and the kid is doing really well. Everything is stable, the vision is really not good, the pressure kind of continued being high, a second glaucoma chunt was implanted, and let's go to the next slide. So the parents called me, 2016, let's go to the next slide and told me, there is kind of a white mass growing inside of the eye. Maybe it's a secondary cataract or maybe it's fibrosis from the chunks that were implanted. Let's next slide, please. And this is kind of what was seen over there. So this looks very strange. It's like a kind of a fibrotic vascular scar tissue formation. It is actually pretty much at the point where the one of the tubes goes inside of the eye. So the first was like a fibrovascular ingrowth from the previous glaucoma procedure. So we took the kid inside to the operating room maybe to remove this growth and we were a big team of people. Retina was there, glaucoma was there, and I was the pediatric ophthalmologist there. And we take this, so we go inside and put our instrument, let's go to the next slide. And this is actually seen with the endoscope from um, the, um, uh, with an endoscope, and this was the view. So this is actually a very typical view of a very malignant condition. Let's go to the next slide. And this is what the kid has after the enucleation. So there is a tumor that is invading all the ciliary body. That, those little uh, kind of cysts that you saw were actually in 360 degrees, and this kid turned to half, next slide, a tumor that is called teratol medullo epithelioma. What is the important part of that? It's a very rare condition, but you have to keep this condition within your differential diagnosis of a patient with a subluxated lens for an unknown reason, because most of these patients are diagnosed very late in life. So I think this is it. Thank you very much for your attention. I don't know if you have any questions. I appreciate it very much. Thank you for having me. Jonathan? That was a really an excellent talk. I learned a lot. Um, <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> I've seen a, a few pictures of subluxated lenses from necrotic frontal lymphoma, and it seems really difficult because they don't put the critical findings in MRI. There's no return to fusion. Um, and then uh, on pathology is really the only way you can diagnose this. But um, our pathologist thinks that from the necrosis, there's some traction in the lens that causes subluxation. Those patients had any vitreous, like a vitreous sittings and... Um, I see. Are there any other questions? Okay. <laughs> okay, Irene. So, thank you. That was a wonderful talk. For the uh, pe pediatricians here, any comment or advice about when to send to you or pediatric op op Right, so, okay, well, thank you. Just um, basic things. I believe that um, I do see a lot of patients that actually uh, are referred, uh, I, I will not call late, uh, 
but um, I think referring patients with ocular misalignment should be done uh, definitely after the age of four months. If you, especially because in the first four months of life, uh, ocular misalignment is common and is very variable. But if something is abnormal and constant after the age of four months, you definitely need to refer that patient to, to a pediatric ophthalmologist or at least an ophthalmologist or somebody can rule out the possibility that is really uh, deviation. Um, in terms of visual acuity, um, I, I think it's important to know about a condition that is called delayed visual maturation. There are going to be a lot of kids that you're going to see in your practice as pediatricians where kids seem not to have good vision. And for us, it's the most important is just find out if the kid is a completely normal kid or not. If you have a kid that is completely normal, it's maybe nothing, and those kids probably will get better. But if you have a kid that has any other abnormalities, you perhaps need to send the patient out. That's probably the two most important things to say. Are you good now? Yes, yes. <laughs> We're a team. <laughs>